Hey, welcome back Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy, and these are all of the Easter eggs, references, and little things you might have missed in The Walking Dead, The Ones Who Live, Episode 5. So we open with the return of Father Gabriel. Now Gabriel first appeared in Season 5, Episode 2 of the original series, following the survivor's encounter with the cannibals at Terminus. I'm Gabriel. Do you have any weapons on you? And do I look like I would have any weapons? Gabriel was also a character in The Walking Dead comics, first appearing in Issue 61. In the TV series, Rick and Gabriel had a really rough start. It took Rick a long time to trust Gabriel. I don't trust this guy. And why? Why do you trust him? But over the years, Gabriel became a core member of Rick's group, and he earned Rick's trust. And after Rick's fate at the bridge, Gabriel stepped up big time and helped lead the group in Rick's absence. We're a fair community of decent-minded people, but we are not soft, and that's not going to change today. In this opening scene, Gabriel is wielding his machete from the original series and wearing his same coat. Now, a little later in the episode, we'll see Jadis, or Anne, meet with Gabriel different times over a three-year period. And we're going to break down exactly what was going on in the original series at those different times, including that mention of the Whisperers. The group we were in conflict with, they compromised our walls. And guys, I have a special announcement to make. We have this great new The Walking Doug parody shirt up on our merch store, ScreenCrushMerch.com, featuring Doug walking me as a zombie, inspired, of course, by Michonne's iconic chain walker technique. Shopping our merch store is one of the best ways to directly support our channel, and we thank you very much for your support. So, back with Rick and Michonne, as they make their way back home to Alexandria, we hear the song Good Life by Frank Sinatra playing. So the lyrics of this song echo Rick's dream state, as we saw earlier in the season. To escape his misery, Rick would escape to his dream world and spend time with Carl. Carl, and after Carl disappeared, he would spend time with Michonne. So when the song says, it's the good life, full of fun, seem to be ideal, lets you hide all the sadness you feel, this is in reference to Rick's escape via dreaming. And the line, you won't really fall in love because you can't take a chance, so be honest with yourself, don't take fake romance. This is in reference to how Rick began to accept his dreams weren't real and never would be. He had accepted that he would never escape the CRM. Be free and explore the unknown can be a reference to both his dream world and the new world he could could explore as a member of the CRM. Like the heartache you learn you must face them alone echoes back to Rick telling Michonne how he would feel when he'd wake up from his dreams and how in order for him to be able to survive he had to die. I know how to be dead and live now. And please remember I still want you is Rick saying that despite how he acted before he truly is happy to be back with Michonne. He says as much here. You know I never let go. And finally, there's Just Wake Up and Kiss That Good Life Goodbye, which is meant to be Michonne telling Rick that he no longer has to dream and that he can wake up and find his dream has come true. We even see Rick looking at this drawing of Carl as the line, wake up, is played, meaning that Rick no longer has to return to the dream world or rely on his dreams to see the ones he loves. Now, you guys may have noticed that we are releasing this breakdown a little bit before the episode airs on AMC, and that's because episodes of The Ones Who Live drop early on AMC+, and they're the sponsor of this video. AMC+, Plus is home to the entire world Walking Dead library, so you can catch up with characters like Maggie, Negan, and Daryl Dixon. It's also home to one of my favorite shows, Mad Men, not to mention a huge selection of movies, BBC America, IFC Unlimited, and the horror platform Shudder, which is like essential for horror fans. They even have exclusive extras like the Better Call Saul employee training series. So check out our link in the description below for a free trial of AMC Plus, terms and conditions apply. And with AMC Plus, you can see the ones who live hours before anyone else, which is the best way to avoid spoilers on social media. Now, throughout this series, there has been a lot of sexual tension between Rick and Michonne. These two can't go five minutes without making out with each other. I mean, this building is collapsing and they're making out in the elevator. But hey, the show is advertised as a love story between these two characters. So of course, these bags of noodles are called tasteful nudes, once again playing into the sexual tension felt throughout the series. Here on this wall is a portrait of horses. Now, horses have played a major part in both Rick and Michonne's stories. Rick traveled into Atlanta on a horse in the very first episode of the Walking Dead original series when he was looking for his family. He also traveled on a horse in his final episode episodes of the series, where in his fever dreams he was still searching for them. And Michonne is also featured on horseback in her quest to find Rick and bring their family back together. So they're the three horses of the apocalypse. Supposed to be four, right? Don't question me, person. Right, sorry, high five. Here again we see Michonne with her new staff, which we pointed out last week is another hint supporting our Moses and Exodus theory. Earlier in the season we saw a sea of walkers separated like when Moses parted the Red Sea, making it to where Michonne could go find Rick and free him from the CRM. And we've theorized that come the end of this season, we'll see Michonne reopen that sea of walkers so that she, Rick, and perhaps other liberated members of the CRM can escape. And just like in Exodus, we'll see that sea of walkers close in on the oppressors. In Moses' case it was the Egyptians, and in Michonne's case it will be the CRM. 
RM. Here on this rack of souvenir plates with names on them, we can see a few familiar names to the Walking Dead family. We've got Andrew, a reference to Andrew Lincoln, who plays Rick Grimes. There's also one that says Rick. There's also a Robert, Robert Kirkman, of course, who wrote the original Walking Dead comic. This one says Jesse, which could be a reference to Rick's love interest prior to Michonne. Granted, it's spelled different. This one says Frank, Frank Darabont being the original creator of the Walking Dead TV series. We also have Greg, Greg Nicotaro being a very important member of the Walking Dead family. Not only did he pioneer all of the awesome zombie makeup for the series, but he's also directed some crucial episodes and even played several walkers. This one says Simon, possibly a reference to Negan's former right-hand man from the original series. And then we have Grace, a possible reference to a Fear of the Walking Dead character who had a romantic relationship with Morgan Jones. Morgan, who of course has a close connection to Rick and who we've speculated may appear on this season of The Ones Who Live. Rick says, The brave man, huh? A reference to Michonne's reveal in the previous episode that that's what Judith and RJ call him, which is a reference back to season 10, episode one of the original series. The brave man couldn't let the walkers reach his friends and hurt them, so he blew up the bridge and all the walkers fell into the water. Here Michonne picks up a small hatchet, suggesting it as a weapon for RJ, citing the fact that Judith has a sword. Judith has a sword. They're us. This is a reference to RJ adopting his father's notorious weapon. Uh, a hatchet? Earlier in the season, we talked about how Rick's trusty hatchet is second only to his Colt Python. Now, we've seen him wield a hatchet in the original series and in the season premiere of this series when he took his own hand. When Rick says he fell in love with his son's best friend, we're reminded of the fact that before Rick and Michonne were a thing, Michonne and Carl had a very close relationship. Like Rick said, they're best friends. My best friend, Michonne. Here we see Rick finally deliver to Michonne her long-requested baking soda and spearmint toothpaste. Baking soda and spearmint, as requested. This is a call back to season six, episode 10 of the original series, when Rick and Daryl are going on a run and Michonne makes this special request. Spearmint and baking soda, that's my favorite. It was also in this episode where Rick and Daryl meet Paul Monroe, AKA Jesus, for the first time. That episode was even called Jesus Take the Wheel. Jesus Take the Wheel. Here on this park sign, we see protect the people from the people. A reminder that in this apocalyptic world, the dead aren't the most dangerous thing out there. It's the living. We're then reminded of this fact when Rick and Michonne encounter another group. Appreciate the help, but we're gonna need more. All of it. Back. Now, in the original series, this would have been the type of scene that was very intense and would have had us wondering how they were going to wiggle out of this one. But I loved how in this series, we see the two very experienced survivors of Rick and Michonne take these guys down with no problem. <laughs> Here we see a stone walker. They get crusty like that because uh, of the steam vents calcified or something. Now this reminded me of several times in the original series and in spinoffs like Daryl Dixon, where the walkers have begun to meld with nature, sometimes making them even more dangerous. In the Daryl Dixon series, we see walkers called burners, whose blood has turned essentially into acid and can burn you with a mere touch. <laughs> This plays into the whole idea of the walkers beginning to evolve, a concept that was introduced in the final season of the original series, with some learning how to climb and open doors. What the f Here we see Rick get his hands back on a silver revolver, and oh my god, guys, getting to see Rick point that gun down at someone, tilt his head, and threaten someone really brought me back. Now, don't get me wrong, I still enjoy the seasons of the original series following Rick's departure, but boy, did I miss my man Stink Eye. You do the same damn Stink Eye as your dad. So, next we get a title card that reads, Three Years Ago, and then we see Gabriel and Anne meeting for the first time since she disappeared with Rick back in season nine of the original series. So, guys, the Walking Dead timeline can get like a little confusing at this point, so I'm gonna have Colton come in and explain exactly when these different flashback scenes with Gabriel are taking place in relation to the original series. Okay, so we know that Rick's been gone about eight years based on how old Michonne says RJ is. So that's our starting point. We also know that after Rick was taken in the helicopter, we saw a six year time skip in season nine, meaning that this first scene with Gabriel and Anne is taking place during that time skip, specifically in the fifth year after Rick had left. Next, we get a two years ago title card, but season 10 of The Walking Dead and the Survivor's War with the Whispers took place just a few months after season nine, meaning that this second scene is taking place after the events of season 10. As Gabriel mentioned, their conflict with another group, that group being The Whispers. And then their final meeting taking place one year ago would be set during the one year time skip we saw at the end of season 11. Now, speaking of flashbacks, there was also Jadis' death scene where we see flashbacks to her and Gabriel from earlier in season 9. We also saw a shot from this very awkward scene between Rick Michonne and Jadis back in season 7. 
I lay with him after. You care? We should get back to work. Yeah. We also got shots of her fellow trash people turned walkers following Simon's attack on their group in season eight. Oh, and we got a shot of Jadis killing Huck in The Walking Dead World Beyond. Sorry, I wasn't listening. Anyways, Gabriel and Anne had a brief romantic relationship in season nine of the original series. But when Gabriel says, My mistake wasn't trusting you. It was losing my faith in you. This is in reference to how she almost handed Gabriel over to the CRM like she did Rick. There's only one place left for me to go. And you're the price of admission. Gabriel really was the perfect character to bring in for Anne slash Jadis' final episode. Not only did he and Anne have a close relationship, but Gabriel's character symbolizes growth and forgiveness. Not only is he a priest, but his character throughout the series has grown so much, and part of that growth was Gabriel learning to forgive himself for abandoning his flock during the first days of the apocalypse. I always lock the doors. I always lock the doors. <laughs> Gabriel has great guilt for his actions, even the actions he's had to take since then during the wartime with the Saviors and the Whispers. But throughout it all, he has served as a rock for not only himself, but for the group as a whole. So it was great seeing his character appear in this episode. It really felt like we were back to watching the original series. And these visits that Anne has with Gabriel really felt like the visits that we were seeing Rick have with Michonne in his dreams earlier in the series. In fact, there were a few times in this episode where I questioned if these meetings between the two were even really happening, or if Jadis was dreaming about her true self, Anne. Here, Gabriel Gabriel mentions Eugene and Rosita. I was using Eugene's ham radio with, with Rosita's help trying to somehow find you. Eugene and Rosita were introduced back in season four of the original series along with fan favorite Abraham. Later in the series, we'd see Gabriel and Rosita have a romantic relationship. Gabriel also mentions Eugene's radio, which was introduced in season nine and resided in the attic at Hilltop. Here, Gabriel says that Rick died trying to bring people together, a reference to how after the war with Negan, Rick tried bringing together all the groups involved, not only the saviors, but Anne as well after having played both sides in the war. We had a deal. Tamiel came for the boat things, followed ones who took, made a better deal. And guys, I'm sorry if I keep jumping between calling her Anne and Jadis, but the show does that too, depending on who she's talking to. You just play games, Anne. You don't give a shit about that army or that city. I do. You think I'm still her, I'm not. I'm not that woman from the heaps either. Next, we get an acknowledgement of the fact that Rick and Michonne were never technically married. And I don't mean like legally or anything, but they have never had a ceremony. In fact, we learned that Rick was planning on proposing and then getting married on the same bridge that he was working so hard to build. One day Rick said that I should marry them. Maybe we should do it right there on the bridge that we were building. Now we've talked before about how that bridge symbolized so much for the future that Rick saw and how he wanted to honor his late son Carl by making that future a reality. When Jadis and the group we met earlier ambush Rick and Michonne, we can see one of them now sporting a CRM rifle. Jadis says, People are a resource. A line we've heard many times throughout this season as well as in the original series from Negan. People are a resource. And in the Maggie and Negan series, Dead City from the Croat. Because people are a resource. Here, Jadis mentions the Cascadia base. Cascadia base is a CRM base in Portland, Oregon, as part of the CRM's three-part alliance. When Jadis says she should have died an artist, we get a flashback to a scene from the original series, where we see Jadis working on a sculpture at the trash camp. And we also see these paintings hanging at Hilltop that Maggie commissioned from Jadis. They include Maggie's father, Herschel, who we first met in season two and lost in season four. Her sister, Beth, who we also first met in season two and then lost in season five. And of course, Maggie's husband, Glenn, who was a huge part of the series starting way back in season one and who we lost to the hands of Negan in season seven. Glenn was crucial to setting Rick on a path that we've followed for all these years. If not for Glenn, Rick would have died in that tank all those years ago and never even found his family. So seeing Glenn's painting in this episode was a really nice touch and played into the theme of all these characters being connected, a theme that was teased in the final episode of the original series that teased this sequel series, The Ones Who Live. Think about them all. Every to day. Everybody we ever loved. Their faces. What I learned from them. How they made me who I am. Here, Jada says, You weren't dreaming, Rick. A reference back to the opening of the episode in that Frank Sinatra song telling Rick to wake up because his dreams have become a reality. Guys, those are all the Easter eggs that we caught in this penultimate episode of The Walking Dead, The Ones Who Live. Tune in next week for our breakdown of the season finale. Big shout out to Colton Ogburn, the guy who's trapped eternally in our television but doesn't know it, so please don't tell him who wrote this video. You can let us know what you thought of the video down in the comments below or add either of us on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.